Okay, acknowledge, but they... Uh, what we're really trying to do right is now. focus our Army on how do you train to sustain readiness with a ethos of fight tonight when you're back in home Pick station. When you don't necessarily know when your next deployment is. What we've tried to encourage our senior commanders to do is, is talk to our uh, junior leaders about how the Army came out of Operation Desert Storm, uh, reduced 100,000 soldiers in a single year, and over the next decade, with a prioritized focus on training and leader development, developed the finest land power that history has probably ever seen that went to war in 2002 and 2003. That decade of focus is the same focus we will apply um, as we go through this transitional period we're in now to ensure that the Army that we have is as ready as it can be and it's led by agile and adaptive leaders who do innovate, who do have the muscle memory of the experiences of this past 12 years of war and apply those in the training environment each and every day at home station. Leader development is high on the list of Army priorities. How do you define leaders? Well, I think uh, the, the well-understood fact is uh, uh, leadership is an asymmetric advantage that the United States Army has uh, at its disposal, and it has been showcased each and every day uh, in, in the environments that we operate in supporting our combatant commanders. We have agile and adaptive leaders. Um, and we've got to continue to focus on their development, to uh, coach and mentor them as we move forward. What gives me great confidence in this period of uh, unprecedented transition as we get smaller uh, as, as an Army is we have the deepest, widest bench of combat experienced leaders we've ever had in our Army. And they're exceptional leaders. They will help us lead this Army through this period of transition as long as we continue to develop them, invest in them, and enable them through mission command to lead their uh, areas of responsibility uh, with the right resources, the right guidance, and really the right left and right limits to be able to fulfill the great potential that they have. U.S. Army Forces Command is tasked with making sure that some 750,000 soldiers are ready to respond to whatever mission comes their way. And as we look at today's world, those missions are constantly changing. So how do you make sure they're ready for whatever? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, the Chief of Staff of the Army clearly articulates how uncertain the environment uh, that we're, we're facing. Uh, the good news is, as you saw at the National Training Center, um, we adapt the training environment that our units uh, experience at the combat training centers literally on a monthly basis to ensure that not only does it reflect the realities of the world that we see, it also projects forward to what we think we'll have to face in the future. Sometimes that means uh, applying the regional uh, and cultural adaptation of the environment that they are regionally aligned against. Uh, sometimes that means adding a nuance to the threat environment that reflects a very prescient and emerging tactic that the enemy may be using in an area of operation we may have to employ to. And I think that adaptive nature that we have with our combat training centers uh, enables units to prepare for that at home station and then come in and test themselves. And, and I think the goal of every commander is to ensure that if he's called to deploy in support of a mission that the nation has given them, uh, that they have prepared that formation for everything they might have to face. And uh, that's what we try to do at our combat training centers. And I, and I think we've been very, very uh, adaptive and flexible uh, in, in the ways that we do that. And uh, the beauty of, uh, of this position, you get to watch our junior leaders at the platoon, company, troop, battalion, and brigade level uh, test themselves against this, this very realistic and challenging scenario. I'm incredibly encouraged at uh, the innovativeness and how quickly they can adapt to overcome the adversity that they face. As we speak today, you are preparing to become the 35th 
vice chief of staff, the Army's second in command that gives you oversight of a million soldiers, their families, a civilian workforce. As you look back at all of your experiences in your career, what will you take with you that's going to help you accomplish this job? Well, I think first and foremost, you never forget where you have come from. And uh, I've been blessed to serve with uh, great leaders, uh, great organizations, uh, in a great army that enables uh, its soldiers to achieve their full potential, an environment of trust uh, that is based on dignity and respect. And uh, that environment is, is one that uh, you try to create everywhere that you serve. And uh, having uh, been up to the, the army staff on a uh, fairly routine basis uh, in my current position, the talent that we have across our, our army staff uh, both in the secretariat as well as uh, within the uniformed uh, staff it is just extraordinary. In the upcoming months, the Army will be undergoing some dramatic changes. Size, uh, equipment, pay. Well, I think our Army has uh, proven throughout its history to be extraordinarily resilient, uh, extraordinarily adaptive, uh, and uh, we leverage the leadership uh, of our organization to ensure that when we face tough decisions, uh, we're basing those decisions on the, the right uh, inputs from our subordinate commands with a, an appropriate focus on the future needs of our nation and what it requires of its army. Uh, and, and that will enable us to at least make informed decisions about what we need to do. Will they be tough decisions? Absolutely. Um, but uh, decisive leaders are, are pretty adept at making tough decisions. Uh, when they leverage the, the input that the entire organization can bring to bear. You speak about combat readiness, and this is key to the Army, but as we face an environment where manpower and money will become even sparser than ever, how do you go about maintaining combat readiness? Some of the practices that we've implemented, uh, both with our Army total force policy efforts uh, here at Forces Command, uh, as well as our uh, commitment to optimize uh, every resource that we have to deliver maximum readiness has been hugely helpful in ensuring that every dollar that we've given delivers the most readiness it can for the nation. We've uh, significantly increased the integrated training approach that we have with all of our components for all of our major training exercises. Uh, what that has enabled us to do is increase the readiness of each of our units while spending less money because we're not contracting out for a capability that lies within our force structure to deliver. Um, that has become more routine. Uh, it must continue to be routine as we go forward uh, and, and it really does enable us to get the most out of uh, what we have. You know, when we first entered sequestration. Uh, Chief of Staff of the Army was extraordinarily concerned about the uncertainty in the world that we face. The fact that um, the environment that we want as we reduce our force uh, doesn't match the environment that we face. He developed the Army Contingency Force construct that enabled us to prioritize resources against a uh, fairly finite number of units to ensure that if the call comes tonight, we have a force in being that is ready to go. Um, that concept endures today. We've actually grown that capability almost twofold uh, as money became available with the Balanced Budget Act. Uh, but the mindset that what we have has to deliver uh, readiness for the fight we might face tonight is a, an ethos that we've you know, really taken on board here. And I think our commanders in the field are absolutely focused on uh, to ensure that uh, we don't get surprised and it doesn't cost us lives as we enter the next conflict. As a senior Army leader, you are tasked with looking at the total Army with greater expectations. Like what? When we say total force is actually active guard and reserve, it's, it's the total Army. Right. Uh, you know, we all wear this same uniform and it, over the heart it says United States Army and that is our total force. The training that we deliver, whether it's to an active soldier, a guard, or a reserve soldier, is the highest quality, most realistic training that we can provide. 
I think you're aware that our first army, uh, which is the, the organization within Forces Command that helps to uh, focus and deliver that quality training to our reserve component uh, units, has uh, implemented a program called Bold Shift, where the focus of their training, which for the last 13 years has been on post-mobilization, they have now shifted their focus to pre-mobilization to enable the high quality training in a pre-mobilization posture uh, so that uh, we make the most out of the 39 days a year that our Guard and Reserve units uh, have to train. That focus, that shift has, has truly enabled us to, to raise the realism, the challenge and the effectiveness of, of the training. And it's also helped us better integrate for our major training events, which is, uh, I think, high payoff. You make it sound pretty simple. Oh, it's, it's anything but simple, but uh, uh, leaders at the strategic level have to take the complex and translate it into uh, tasks and missions that our uh, subordinate units can execute. We've implemented a partnership program that has enabled all of our reserve component units that have a counterpart capability in the active force to have a teammate with which to work. Um, that are in most cases regionally closely aligned uh, so that that training can happen on a fairly uh, routine basis to enable opportunities uh, in the local area that don't have to wait for a combat training center to leverage the capabilities that each of our uh, components bring to bear. Other issues being faced here at Forces Command and at the Pentagon are what I would call the human side of the Army, suicides, PTSD, Ethics. The Army profession uh, is all about uh, creating an environment where uh, every soldier is treated with dignity and respect and has the uh, recognition that uh, this is the greatest profession in the world that will enable them to achieve their full potential and then creating that environment of trust where that's a reality each and every day. And I've got uh, great confidence that that will remain uh, a, a huge area of focus for us. We are implementing more uh, clear focus across the board on our command climate, assessing that more routinely uh, to provide that feedback to our commanders on how we're doing and, and where we need to improve. I think the dialogue that we have with our soldiers and their willingness to come forward and say, hey, this isn't where it needs to be. We need to focus on this. And our commanders very rapidly getting after those areas uh, where we're falling short uh, is, is the strength of our Army. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's all about our people. Our people are uh, our greatest uh, uh, resource, and we've uh, made a huge investment in them, and we will continue to do so. As you know, September is Suicide Prevention Month. And the message from the Army is resiliency. Resiliency is key, especially for combat veterans. Sir, you're a combat veteran many times over. Is resiliency enough? I think uh, resiliency uh, and strengthening the resilience of each and every uh, soldier, family member, civilian that serves the United States Army not only assists in how you deal with the adversity that inevitably each and every person faces as they go through life, uh, is a life skill that will make them uh, stronger and better a as a soldier for life. And so I'm absolutely uh, convinced that uh, anything that we can do to strengthen the resiliency of, of those who serve in the United States Army is going to help the nation concurrently. As our soldiers transition back to civilian life, as they continue to be ambassadors for this great profession, uh, the United States Army, we don't have the same level of resiliency in every human being uh, in America. And so that has to be adaptive enough to recognize uh, where somebody's developmental skills are not where they need to be and to apply the great resources available to us to help rapidly strengthen that resilience as best we can. That really is the challenge. One size does not fit all. Um, every human being has different needs and uh, having that transparent dialogue between the first line leaders and the individual soldiers is, is a critical variable in ensuring that, that we have the engaged leadership that can help us uh, work on this resiliency as we go forward. On the subject of strategy, 
regionally aligned forces. Are they still part of the Army's future? Well, I think our Army has proven over this past year that we truly are globally responsive and regionally engaged. The soldiers of the United States Army operating often in, in very small teams of two, three, 10, 12 soldiers uh, led by agile and adaptive leaders have delivered tailored capabilities to our combatant commanders in an unprecedented precedent way so far in 2014 in direct support of expanding uh, the Chief's vision with regional aligned forces. By the end of the third quarter of uh, 2014, we had already delivered more capability to combatant commanders than we did throughout 2013. And that's despite the impact of sequestration on the front end of this year. We are making a huge difference. Um, our forces are uh, available, accessible, and through our Army Service Component Commanders, identifying the requirements that they have to support the combatant commanders' theater security cooperation plans, we have enabled uh, the total force to contribute uh, in ways that are incredibly relevant and important to our Army's ability to help combatant commanders shape and prevent the next conflict. Let's talk a little bit about Afghanistan. Afghanistan is winding down. What impact will that have on the Army? What's the ripple effect? We are at war in Afghanistan today. Uh, we have 30,000 plus soldiers serving in Afghanistan, uh, and that will remain job one for us in the United States Army until we are mission complete. We will provide whatever capability that General Campbell needs uh, to fulfill that mission that he has. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, that, that is uh, our commitment, that is our priority, and we will fulfill that mission. Uh, with trained and ready forces and with apti adaptive and agile leaders who will meet the complexities of drawing down in a very, very tough environment in the midst of all that is, uh, is going on there in Afghanistan and the complexities of that political environment. Um, what we have already seen as we have reduced our uh, force posture in Afghanistan is we have more Army forces available to support the needs of other combatant commanders around the globe. 17,000 soldiers already have deployed in support of regional aligned force missions in support of all of our combatant commanders. Uh, and so it, it's, it's pretty exciting. And the Chief's commitment is if, if a soldier doesn't have an assigned mission, he will be regionally aligned against a combatant commander's requirement and we're fulfilling that here uh, each and every day in the United States Army. The Army of the future is going to be leaner, and some would say meaner. Fewer soldiers, newer equipment. Will this be enough to meet the nation's demands for combat? The Army uh, will be the size that uh, uh, the, the senior leadership of, of the United States determine that it will be. Uh, our mission is to ensure that whatever size that is, is trained and ready to respond to the demands uh, of an uncertain environment. We will be uh, incredibly focused over the next several years to ensure that we modernize, uh, we equip, and we prepare our forces for the uncertainties uh, that are out there. Uh, we're building toward uh, Force 2025 and beyond. We're developing and refining the Army operating concept to ensure we're on that path. Uh, and uh, we'll be postured to fight tonight uh, with the forces that we have to ensure that they're uh, as equipped and ready as they can possibly be. Sir, you have said that your greatest asset are the people. As you prepare to step into the Vice Chief of Staff job, what message would you have the people know? We are absolutely committed uh, to the care and uh, development of every single person that serves uh, in the United States Army in any role that you play. We're going to do everything that we can to enable you to achieve your full potential. We care about our uh, members of the United States Army. We care about the profession. We're committed to ensuring that we deliver the, the greatest opportunity for you to excel.